This is an auto-narrated audiobook by Google's computer-generated AI voices. Protected Mate Book 3 in the Brides for Beasts Bear series by Candace Ayers and Kim Dillon. Copyright 2023 by Lovestruck Romance All Rights Reserved To ensure these authors are able to bring you more free content, please support them by subscribing to this channel. Chapter 1 Okay boys, remember, we're here to have fun, not turn into wild animals, I call through my cupped hands to the group of shifter youngsters out on the baseball diamond. Though I guess turning into wild animals isn't too far off base for us, huh? There's an immediate chorus of groans punctuated by a few random giggles. I grin thoroughly pleased with myself. All right, all right. Connor, you're up to bat. Connor trudges forward his head low, gripping the baseball bat like it's a lifeline. I crouch down to meet the wide-eyed eight-year-old at his level. Hey kiddo, remember that in baseball, as in life, the key is to hit it hard. I flash him my most encouraging grin and pat him on the back gently. All right champ. Show him what you're made of. Connor nods, determined, and I can't help but feel a burst of pride. I retreat to the dugout and lower myself on the bench. The bat's nearly bigger than he is, but I'll be damned if the kid doesn't swing it like a pro. Whoosh, crack. I glance over at the bleachers where moms and dads are lounging in the afternoon sun, a living tapestry of family life. The sight brings a painful twinge of longing. I mentor. I coach, and I have a killer repertoire of dad jokes but I'm not actually a dad, and that's a bitter pill. Don't get me wrong, I adore these ankle biters, but I want a cub of my own to coach. I want a wife to share the triumphs and trials of parenthood with. For a long time it's been nothing but a pipe dream because the well of single she bears in Mystic Hollow has run dry. Fortunately, the council cooked up this BFB Brides for Beasts program and asked me if I would volunteer. Hell yeah I'll volunteer. I intend to be the first beast to find his bride. Loud whoops and cheers come from the stands. Little Connors knocked it out of the park and is rounding the bases. Yeah. That's my boy. I hear Connor's proud dad holler, and the pang in my heart sharpens. Someday, I'll have a little one of my own. Someday, I'll be in the stands with a mate beside me, and we'll be shouting praises at a mini-me out on the field. Someday, I'll be teaching my own little one to ride a bike. Someday, I'll be checking under the bed and in the closet for monsters. And when that day comes, I'll be the luckiest bear on the planet. Amid the hoots, hollers, and high fives, I find myself sporting a goofy smile. I stick two fingers up to my lips and blow a loud whistle. All right team, gather round. They rush over, a medley of furrowed brows, toothy grins and eager eyes, to form a semicircle around me. My face grows solemn. First, I have a serious question. I wait until all little sets of eyes are on me. Can anyone tell me why baseball players don't join unions? I arch a brow as I scan the boys' faces. They exchange confused glances, shrugging their shoulders. Because they don't like to be called out on strikes. My joke is met by a wave of groans and eye rolls, and accompanied by a few reluctant chuckles. Mission accomplished. I look down into the beaming face of Connor. Way to go, Connor. I lift my hand for a high five, then move it out of the way so Connor's little paw misses my hand entirely. We both laugh and I ruffle his hair. Great job, champ. Laughter rings out, alongside playful jeers and spirited banter. The kids are rowdy, and I can't blame them. Their win today was well earned. Good game today. I dismiss the kids and watch the boys bask in their moment of triumph as they run over to their families who are stepping down from the stands. Parents sweep their kids into hugs, high-fiving, ruffling hair and clapping shoulders. See ya, Coach Waylon. Ethan calls and I wave. Excitement buzzes in the air. I watch them interact with their families, the easy bond they share and I feel a deep yearning. My bear stirs inside restlessly and grumbles a low lonely sound. Family. A wife. Cubs of my own. Will I ever have that? As the families slowly clear out and head home, I find myself standing alone on the empty field staring after them. Chapter 2 I'm wedged between the bar and an avalanche of insecurities, a Chardonnay clutched in my sweaty hand like a security blanket. This cocktail party is the first of the BFB events, so I had to at least make an appearance. The chatter of flirty conversations buzzes around me, and all I want to do is blend into the woodwork. 
The other women have gleaming smiles, glamorous hair, and dresses that look like they've been painted onto perfect bodies. And the men. The men of Mystic Hollow are an enigma. The BFB program promised they'd be financially stable, but they're dazzling. Tall, handsome as hell, and rugged, some have laughter in their eyes, others a mysterious allure that screams wealth and power. And then there's me. Plain brown hair, average figure, and a dress that's straight off the rack of First Presbyterian thrift store. A weed in the flower garden. While these women are hoping to be swept off their feet by a wealthy husband, I, well, I'm just hoping not to trip over mine. I'm not here for love. I'm here for escape. To hide. To get as far from him as humanly possible. At the thought of my ex, I suppress a shiver. Theo is a man who thinks commitment is a synonym for ownership, a man who delivers love notes with his fists, a man whose angry expression sends icy tendrils of fear down my spine. Not here, Alice. Not now. I take another sip of my wine, more for something to do than any actual enjoyment of the taste. I feel like a spectator, rather than a participant. That's okay. BFB isn't my answer to a new life. It's simply a getaway vehicle. Another ten minutes or so, and I can go back to my cabin and curl up with a good book. Until then I'm content to just be the mousy woman in the corner with the lukewarm wine and the hopeful heart. Hi, I'm Balin. The woman who greets me wears a smile that's genuine and warm. Hey. Alice. Even to my own ears, I sound clumsy and unsophisticated. I mean, am I supposed to add something? Alice, professional botanist and current wallflower? Like a dork, I wave a little too enthusiastically. Alice, try not to be your awkward self. Balin leans in, lowering her voice conspiratorially. Is it just me, or is this like an episode of The Bachelor? I let out a laugh that's just a notch too loud, earning a few glances from the glamazons around us. I was thinking the same thing. How are these guys single? Balin and I hit it off. She seems to feel out of place too. I sigh. I feel like a dandelion in a field of roses. Although I will admit to feeling an uncanny kinship with the dandelion. Dandelions are fighters. They're resilient. They may not be as flamboyant as roses, but they've got spirit. They're survivors. My past isn't far enough behind me for me to feel safe yet, but for now, I'm here. It's a temporary sanctuary. I take another sip of Chardonnay, letting the motion distract me from my spiraling thoughts. Before Balin and I can really get to know one another, a hottie makes a beeline across the room to introduce himself to her. He doesn't even see me here next to her. I might as well be invisible. If a wallflower could wither and wilt into the soil, that would be me right now. I fiddle with the stem of my glass, tracing the outline with my thumb. A bubbly blonde is batting her eyelashes at a tall, broad-shouldered man to my right while Balin's admirer is practically drooling on her to my left. Maybe one day, I whisper to myself. Just not today. My book is back at the cabin waiting for me. It's time to make myself scarce. Ladies hang off me like ornaments off a Christmas tree, only it's not Christmas and I'm not a Douglas fir. The murmur of the cocktail party buzzes around us as each of the hangers-on vies for my attention. Waylon, you're so handsome. Ku's a blonde in a red number that's two sizes too small for her comfort. She better not sit down or she'll bust a seam. Thank you, babe. I wouldn't normally call a woman babe, but I forgot her name. I hope you know CPR, babe, cause you take my breath away. She giggles, and I navigate the sea of women with the skill of a seasoned sailor. They laugh at my jokes, bask in my compliments, and a couple of them even invite me back to their cabins. If this were a regular shindig, I'd be king of the cocktail party. Only it's not, and I'm not. Under all the forced laughs and fake smiles, I'm feeling about as hollow as a rotten log. A brunette with a dress full of sequins rises to her toes and leans in. Her perfume makes my eyes water. Did she bathe in the stuff? Your eyes are captivating, Waylon. Well, they've been known to hold a gaze or two. They're kinda clingy like that. All the women giggle. This must be what a prize stallion at an auction feels like. Not sure what I expected. I guess I thought when it was time to choose, one woman would stand out. Our eyes would meet and I'd know she's the one. A growl of frustration rumbles in my chest. I swallow it down with a swig of whiskey that tastes like liquid disappointment. 
Any one of these women could be my future wife, the mother of my cubs. They're all lovely. They've got looks, brains, and spirit. Some more than others. But none makes my pulse race. A brunette here, a redhead there, blondes scattered all around like stars in the night sky, but no constellations. No patterns, no connection. Just emptiness. Using my empty tumbler to escape, I extricate myself from the circle of women. Excuse me, ladies. A chorus of murmured complaints arises, but I ignore them and head to the bar. I thought this would be easier, I tell Hernan as I step up beside him. His eyes are glued to a tall, curvy redhead. You know, like our gazes would meet and bam. Instant connection. Sounds like a Hallmark movie, Hernan quips, flagging down the bartender for another round. I don't think it matters much. Just pick one and that's that. Cheerios. Frosted Flakes. Wheaties. They all make a decent breakfast. There's nothing like using a good old cereal analogy when it comes to making life-altering decisions, I deadpan. Hernan grins, a cheeky glint in his eye. You remember eeny meeny miny mo? Perhaps he's right. Maybe I'm thinking too hard. But just as the bartender hands me my drink, something hits me. An enticing aroma breaks through the overpowering mishmash of cloying perfumes. It's different. Alluring as hell. It tickles the back of my throat and stirs something primal within me. It's an intoxicatingly clean but delicate scent like green grass with a hint of fresh daisies. Whatever it is, it sets my senses on fire and sends a jolt straight through me right to the head of my dick. Now that's a scent a man could wake up next to. But when I look around, I can't pin down its source. Hernan, do you smell that? My cock is literally straining the zipper of my jeans as my eyes scan the crowd. He sniffs, winces, and his nose wrinkles. The stink of perfume and the reek of desperation. It should be illegal, a nasal assault. Not that. The scent is like a field of daisies. I lean back on the bar and scan the room. It isn't from a bottle. It's natural. Wild and untamed, yet feminine and delicate. I can't pinpoint its source. A field of daisies, huh? You sure you ain't been hitting the whiskey too hard tonight? The scent is already fading. Frustrated, I set my glass on the bar. I need some air. Wait, you're not leaving, are you? Hernan looks at me as though I've just sprouted toadstools on my forehead. The night's just begun. My answer is a half-hearted shrug. I can't smell that tantalizing aroma anymore, but the way it stirred me lingers. Maybe letting my bear out for a run will clear my head. It usually does. Well, Hernan calls to my back. I'll keep an eye out for Miss Daisy Field. Disheartened, dispirited, and downcast, I slip out the back door and into the woods. Chapter 3 With my leather-bound journal in one hand and a stubby pencil in the other, I make my way through the woods. I could be mingling with the other picnickers right now at BFB's Picnic in the Park event. I could be fluttering my lashes at a suitor or giggling coquettishly at a display of machismo. But that's not my scene. Not when I can traipse through the forget-me-nots and wild ferns. Sunlight filters through the canopy overhead, dappling the ground with flecks of gold. Birds chirp in the distance. It's peaceful, it's beautiful, and I prefer the company of plants over people any day. Ah, spotted lady slipper. I squat down to observe the elusive wildflower. It's not every day you find a plant that's as fussy about its environment as a socialite at a backyard cookout. Flipping open the worn leather journal, I note the location and characteristics of the spotted lady slipper as well as draw a quick sketch before continuing. I did try to strike up a conversation earlier with one of the guys at the picnic. What was his name? Xenon. Zoro. It went okay until I found myself lecturing him on the reproductive process of gymnosperms and angiosperms. His eyes glazed over which of course made me nervously self-conscious, so instead of shutting up, I veered off into a monologue about the medicinal benefits of Withania somnifera. I could almost hear his red flag checklist being ticked. Super nerdy. Check. Talks about plants like they're people. Check. Below average in looks, personality, and just about everything. Check, check, and double check. He beat a hasty retreat. Not that I blame him. I'm not for everyone. Honestly, I'm not for anyone. Oh, look. Wild ginger. 
I scramble toward the heart-shaped leaves. Asarum canadense. So far this BFB thing isn't bad. A couple of weeks of free room and board in the small mountain town without Theo's menacing shadow looming over me is just what I need. Sitting back on my heels, I notice the shadows have grown long. Dusk is creeping in, and I don't want to have to navigate these woods after sundown. I begin to retrace my steps. Like Hansel in the fairy tale, I left myself a breadcrumb trail. Only instead of breadcrumbs. I follow the line of plastic forks I swipe from the picnic table and stuck in the ground at intervals. Bending I yank a fork from the moist soil then gingerly tiptoe around a patch of wildflowers, pausing only briefly to jot down observations. Origeron strigosis. Beautiful. I mumble to myself, crouching to admire the scruffy white petals. Several feet later, I snatch another fork from the ground, then straighten and nearly come face to bare butt with. I freeze, clutching the fistful of forks. My cheeks redden like two big ripe tomatoes. I blink, not sure if what I'm seeing is real. I blink again. It's definitely a man. He's definitely real. He's definitely naked. And he's definitely standing not twenty feet from me. Maybe she's your fated mate. I stand in the woods bare-assed about to shift. Silas, Sandros, Lake, and Hernan already transformed into their bears and took off running. I'll catch up. I don't know why I'm standing here contemplating the existential crisis that is my love life. In my birthday suit no less. Yes I do. It's because as Silas bellyached about Kate, Zandros said what he said. Maybe she's your fated mate. Fuck. Their ribbing and laughter still echo through my head. I heave a sigh and my shoulders droop in resignation. This isn't going to be easy. I'd thought, or at least hoped, that some serendipitous force would help me find a wife by guiding us to one another. I can't help but chuckle at that. Hernan's right. I've watched too many of those sappy Hallmark movies. I mean seriously, who even thinks they'll just lock eyes with someone and know in an instant they're the one? That's the stuff of fairy tales and rom-coms. I'll have to roll up my sleeves, do the legwork, spend time with every BFB lady one-on-one. -on -one. It's going to be a pain in the ass, but the thought of having a life partner, of cubs scampering around pulling at my ears and climbing up my back gives me enough motivation to face this daunting task head-on. A family isn't something that can be won with a one-liner and a wink. I talked to a few bride candidates today at the picnic, trying to get a sense of who they are beyond their manicures and hair extensions. Marianne, the vivacious brunette who talked a mile a minute about the latest reality TV shows. Tabitha, the demure blonde who could match me joke for joke. Margot, with never-ending stories about her five cats. No spark. Time to let my bear take over for a while. I need to burn off this disheartening energy and clear my head. I feel a tingle. The familiar sensation arises as my body readies itself for the transformation, her fur sprouting, bones shifting and muscles expanding. Closing my eyes. I take a deep breath. And that's when it happens. The wind shifts slightly, and along with the scent of pine trees and mountain air, I catch a phantom aroma as elusive as it is tantalizing. It's the sweet intoxicating scent from the cocktail party, the one that stirred something deep inside me. It's fresh and earthy like morning dew on a field of daisies. I tried desperately to catch another whiff of it at the picnic earlier, but no go, so I assumed it was my imagination. An olfactory illusion. I jolt. My eyes widen. My nose twitches. My head swings around following the scent, and that's when I see her. Our eyes lock. It feels like a damn freight train plows into me at full speed. Everything becomes clear. Focused. Her wide-eyed gaze is the color of fresh spring leaves. Her lips are parted in surprise. It's a moment of clarity, a moment of pure truth. It's her. It's her. And then she screams. I gasp when the naked man starts to sprout fur all over his exquisitely sculpted, well-muscled physique. Our eyes meet. And lock. There's a moment of stunned silence in which I stand gaping because he's no longer a man. I'm staring at a grizzly bear. What in the hallucinatory hell? The bear looks at me. I look at the bear. Logic and reason tell me this is impossible, but there he is. Or it is. I stumble back, my mind unable to comprehend this. It can't be real. It just can't. Did I unknowingly ingest salvia divinorum? 
Maybe Datura Stramonium? I'm having a psychedelic trip in the middle of the woods. The bear's eyes are filled with what? Curiosity? Hunger? I have no idea. All I know is that I need to get out of here. Fast. So what do I do? I pivot on my heel and do the one thing you're never supposed to do when facing a grizzly bear. I run. Screaming at the top of my lungs, I sprint through the trees. Legs pumping. Heart pounding. But as I run, I remember that grizzly bears can move pretty darn fast, and I'm no Usain Bolt. How does one avoid a fast-running bear? Serpentine, Alice, serpentine. I race through the woods like a madwoman, ducking, weaving, dodging branches, bushes, roots, and rounding tree trunks. I hope my zigzagging path will throw the bear off my trail. I'm pretty sure I read somewhere that it confuses them or something. I hope it's true because right now, I'm relying on my questionable knowledge of bear behavior to save my life. Hey, what do I know? I'm high on a hallucinogen. It's not until I finally break through into the clearing of cabins, lungs heaving, that I realize the bear isn't chasing me. But why be rational now? I run all the way to my cabin, slam the door behind me, and engage the deadbolt. Panting and sweaty, I sink to the floor. Then I burst out laughing. I'm such a complete moron. It wasn't real. It couldn't have been real. What in the actual hell was in those picnic brownies? Chapter 4 Balin looks like she's seconds from tossing her cookies. The smell of popcorn clearly doesn't agree with her. Why don't you head back to your cabin? I can handle this myself. You sure? She's cupping her mouth and looks kinda green, so I nod. Pulling popcorn duty gives me the perfect excuse to avoid all the testosterone at the event tonight. I'm positive. Now go. With a grateful look, Balin takes off, leaving me solo to man the popcorn stand at movie night under the stars. I have to admit, the concept is charming. A projector screen has been erected at the edge of a clearing and everyone's lounging on blankets or low chairs, munching popcorn, hot dogs and cotton candy. My thoughts have been stuck in a loop, repeating the same image over and over again, a man turning into a bear. I know it's impossible. I'm a scientist for goodness sake. I believe in science, not. Whatever that was. As I pour another scoop of popcorn into a bowl for the next customer, I'm still trying to figure out what brought on the bizarre hallucination. Stress? Probably. I huff a humorless laugh. Theo strikes again. That popcorn looks amazing. The deep smooth voice sends tingles shooting straight to my core. I glance up, recognize him immediately, and freeze. My heart skips a beat. It's the naked man from the park. He's real. Only now he's wearing clothes. Which I should be relieved by, but a small part of me feels slightly disappointed. Hi there. He flashes a friendly grin that makes my knees feel like jelly. Ah, uh, hi, I stammer. Trying my best to appear casual and nonchalant, I hand him a bowl overflowing with popcorn. Thanks. That irresistible grin remains plastered on his face. I'm Waylon. He continues to stare at me and my stomach does little flips until it dawns on me he's waiting for me to speak. Gah, I'm so stupid. I'm Alice. It's only with effort that I keep my voice steady. I can't seem to look him in the eye. An awkward silence ensues. So Alice, do you know what Popcorn's favorite thing about school is? My forehead creases in confusion, but he doesn't wait for a reply. Pop quizzes. I can feel him watching me, and I smile. More awkward silence. Great movie, huh? He gestures toward the screen with his overflowing bowl, and a few kernels fall on the grass. Oh yeah. I don't even bother to look up this time. I know he's trying to engage me in conversation, but I'm such a doofus, too tongue-tied to respond with anything more than body gestures and one-word answers. I wring my hands nervously and after a few more seconds, he sighs and wanders away, leaving me alone with my thoughts. Well that ends that. Except not ten minutes later, Waylon's back for more popcorn. He's really hot and he's flashing a flirty smile at me. It's unnerving me big time. I guess you could say I'm a popcorn -a sir. He winks at me and grins, clearly proud of his pun. Blushing furiously, I refill his bowl. Butterflies flit around in my stomach as I watch him walk away. 
Part of me wonders if he's using the popcorn as an excuse to talk to me, but there's no way someone like him would be interested in someone like me. Get it together, Alice, I mutter under my breath, shaking my head. The next time Waylon returns for a refill, I actually manage an intelligible sentence. You must love popcorn. Seriously. How much popcorn can one guy eat? It's the man's third refill. Popcorn or the pretty lady serving it. He winks, sending a jolt of pulsing heat straight to my vagina. I give a shaky laugh. Care to join me? He points to a nearby blanket, a hopeful look in his eyes. He's inviting me to sit on the blanket with him? My heart stutters like we're in a schoolyard and he's the popular jock, asking me, the weird nerdy bookworm, to join his gang of cool kids. I'm flattered, but I have enough on my plate without adding romantic complications into the mix, so I shake my head. I wouldn't want to leave the popcorn station unattended. He looks disheartened. Right. His brows knit together in what I can only assume is disappointment. He flashes me another disarming smile, then walks away. A strange longing unfurls in my gut. I haven't been this attracted to a man. Well, ever. But Waylon should be chatting up other women, not wasting his time on me. Yet Waylon returns again and again. Each time with a new joke that under any other circumstances I might find endearing but now I find confusing. Each time he lingers longer, watching me with a soft smile. I tell myself it's just his personality. He's very outgoing. But his gaze is unsettling and strangely appealing. This may sound corny. His grin widens. But I was hoping to butter you up. Despite myself, I momentarily forget my fears, anxieties, and hang-ups, and let out a genuine bark of laughter. For a moment it's just him and me, a man and a woman, under a starlit sky with sexual chemistry swirling around us like a cyclone. But only for a moment. My mind quickly replays that strange hallucination of him naked and my laughter fades. My cheeks burn with embarrassment. I swallow hard and look away. He studies me. His eyes soft. I didn't mean to make you uncomfortable, he says gently. Then, almost reluctantly, he steps back, gives a slight nod, and heads over to his blanket. I tell myself it's for the best, but my heart sinks. Okay, that's enough, I finally decide, grabbing my phone. The movie isn't anywhere near finished, but I can't stand being here any longer. So I close everything up, slip away from the popcorn stand, and wind my way through the moviegoers and into the woods that lead to my cabin. I use my phone as a flashlight as I tread carefully between tall pines. The cool night air feels refreshing against my flushed cheeks, and I take several deep breaths, trying to clear my head. The woods are my sanctuary, a place where I can lose myself in the beauty of nature and forget about my awkward interactions with other humans. As I walk, I think about Waylon. Naked. Which is absolutely the last thing I should think about. But I can't help it. I feel such a strong pull toward him, an inexplicable connection. He's charming and funny, and his laughter is infectious. Plus, his constant craving for popcorn is kind of endearing. There's a rustling of leaves behind me, and when a twig snaps, my heart leaps into my throat. I whirl around, holding my phone up to illuminate the darkness. Waylon. I gasp, reeling back at the sight of his imposing figure. His eyes are kind, almost apologetic. Didn't mean to scare you. He holds his hands aloft in mock surrender. Just wanted to make sure you got back okay. Right, I stammer, trying not to hyperventilate. What is wrong with me? Quietly, he falls into step beside me, his hands in his pockets. My mind is still on what I saw in the woods yesterday. I know it wasn't real, even though it felt like it. But I didn't think Waylon truly existed either, yet here he is, so at least that part of my hallucination was real. What if... We are about to reach my cabin, when I just can't hold it in anymore. It nags on my mind so much, the question pops out before I can stop it. Did you turn into a bear? Oh my god. What am I saying? I immediately regret opening my big mouth. He starts to answer, but I cut him off, shaking my head furiously. No, forget I ax. I can't believe I said that. I turn abruptly and as I walk across the clearing toward my cabin, my face feels like it's on fire. I'm so embarrassed. And since apparently I'm not awkward enough, I launch into a full-on conversation with myself, mumbling aloud, berating my stupidity. God, you're so stupid, see, this is why nobody likes you because you say the weirdest things at the most inappropriate times, I mean, who even asked someone if they turned into a bear? 
I huff a self-deprecating laugh. You are such a loser. It's not until I reach my cabin that I realize Waylon is right behind me. When I turn and look up at him, his jovial, carefree demeanor is gone. His brow is furrowed, his expression is dark, and his eyes are hard. Terror grips me. I've seen that look before and I know what it means. It's the calm before the storm. Waylon is angry, really angry. No, not angry. He's downright pissed. Chapter 5 I'm livid. Not at Alice. My anger is aimed at whoever made her feel so small, so insignificant. She may have thought she was speaking under her breath, but my shifter hearing picked up every cruel word she said about herself. If I heard anyone else talk that way about her, I'd tear their head clean off their neck and shit down their throat. Things about Alice are starting to click together like puzzle pieces. It was obvious when I first approached her tonight how incredibly shy she is. Hell, I had to return to the popcorn stand five times before she'd let down her guard enough to talk to me without blushing. I consumed more popcorn tonight alone than I have in my entire life prior. I don't even like popcorn. It infuriates me that she actually seems to believe these things about herself. Who the hell did this to her? Who made her feel this way about herself? Alice isn't weird. She's different. Captivating. Beautiful. She's not awkward. She's unique. She stands out like a sparkling diamond in a pile of coal. And the loser bit. That's the biggest crock of horseshit I've ever heard. Someone drilled those false narratives into her head, I'm certain of it, and if I find out who, I'll make them regret it. The thought brings a low growl from the back of my throat. Alice flinches at the sound. Her body tenses and she backs away from me. The moment it happens, I want to kick my own ass for scaring her. It's okay, I say softly. I'm not going to hurt you. Alice relaxes slightly and looks up at me with wide eyes. You look angry. Her voice is small. I am angry. I sigh and run my fingers through my hair. Not at all. When Alice smiles tentatively, I do my best to remain calm, cool and collected. You weren't seeing things. You did see me change into a bear. She lets out a nervous chuckle and her eyes are sad. You're teasing me. What? She thinks I'm making fun of her. I have to play my cards right here, be gentle with her. I shake my head, trying to force a grin onto my face. No, Alice. I need to ask you to keep it top secret, but I'm a bear shifter. Her smile is brittle. She's not buying it, I can tell. She saw me with her own eyes and she still doesn't believe me, but that's okay. I'll prove it to her, in time. Slow and steady. Everything about this woman drives me wild. Her intoxicating scent fills my nostrils and sparks a primal possessiveness in me. I want to protect her, I want to possess her, and I want to show her just how incredible she truly is, but I need to proceed with caution. I was watching you. Every cell in my body hums with the need to claim her, and my bear is urging me on. What? She seems alarmed again, so I keep my next words light and gentle. I saw you stop several times to look at plants. A soft blush paints her cheeks as she averts her gaze, her fingers fidgeting with the hem of her blouse. Oh, um, I... I'm a botanist. I love plants. They make so much more sense than humans. A laugh bubbles up from my chest at her charming frankness. Well, I can't argue with that. My mind turns over what she said. I've never met a botanist before. My bear is pushing me to get closer to her, to take her in my arms and show her how good I can make her feel. I ease into my next question. Tomorrow is the group hike. We're all supposed to meet for breakfast at Mama's Den Diner. Can I pick you up in the morning so we can go together? Alice freezes, staring up at me with wide doe-like eyes. Why? Why would you want to go with me? I'm taken aback, and my anger spikes again. This time I do a better job of controlling my features so as not to reveal my emotions. You're teasing me again. She looks crestfallen, and I want to punch someone. I like your company. I try to keep my voice light and casual and give her a reassuring smile. Alice stares at the ground for a moment, seemingly baffled by my request. You're a bride candidate in BFB. Why wouldn't I want to spend time with you? She shrugs, still unsure. I know I don't measure up to the other women in the program. 
I'm not beautiful or well dressed or socially proficient. I struggle to keep my fury at bay. Alice, any man would be fucking lucky to find himself in your company. You are amazing. You're kind and you are beautiful. And you dress just fine. I reach out to tuck a strand of hair behind her ear. The moment my fingers make contact with her cheek, an electric current sizzles between us. It's like a rope tethering us to one another. Her eyes widen and, oh shit, I smell her arousal. I can't help it, I lean in and to my surprise she doesn't back away. She leans in too. So I lower my lips to hers. And I kiss her. Chapter 6 I feel my breath hitch in my throat as Waylon leans in. I know he's going to kiss me and Lord help me, I want it. His lips brush against mine with a gentle caress and I feel the spark that passes between us all the way to my toes. His kiss is sweet and light at first, but when his tongue runs over the seam of my lips and I part them, he deepens the kiss, exploring my mouth hungrily. My pulse races. His hands run up my arms, sending tingles of pleasure through me. The heat radiating from his body makes me dizzy. When he lets out a soft groan of pleasure, my heart swells and my hands reach around his neck, pulling him even closer to me. For a moment, everything else fades away until there's just us, caught in a moment of pure bliss. Nothing else matters. I feel completely and wondrously alive in his embrace. When he finally pulls away, I expect him to stop, but he doesn't. He lowers his mouth to my neck and presses soft kisses over my pulse point. I squirm and rub my thighs together. Waylon. My voice comes out all breathy and gasping, and I tilt my head to give him better access. He takes full advantage, scattering kisses down my neck to my collarbone. As his hands slide under my blouse to caress my bare skin, my back arches and I moan, my fingers threading through his hair. A rumbling growl comes from his chest, but this time the growl isn't scary at all. It makes my panties grow damp and my nipples tighten into little buds. I have to fight not to grind against him. I want this man with a fierceness that defies logic. When his hands drift down to cut my backside, hiking me up and pulling me firmly against him, I spread my legs and wrap them around his waist. He makes a sound low in his throat and rubs his erection against my core. We're both fully clothed, but the friction sends sparks of pleasure through me. He returns to my mouth to capture me in another searing kiss, and I melt into him. I can't help the flutters in my lower belly or the needy shiver that courses through me. I've never felt so alive, so wanted. When he breaks off the kiss, his lips find the sensitive skin beneath my ear, then he nibbles gently on my earlobe. You drive me fucking wild. Waylon murmurs. His desire is palpable, and yet he remains gentle. Patient. I let out a shaky breath, feeling both nervous and excited as my hand moves toward his belt. My fingers brush against the buckle, hesitating for just a moment as I try to quell the nagging doubts in the back of my mind. Should I? Can I? Is it safe to let go? I want so badly to be one of those women who just has casual sex without second-guessing every last thing. But I'm just not. As if sensing my inner turmoil, Waylon sets me on my feet, and his eyes hold mine with a gaze that is full of longing but also filled with understanding. Waylon, I... I pause, struggling to find the right words to express the whirlwind of emotion swirling within me. I... I don't even have to finish my sentence. Hey. He cradles my face in his hands. We don't have to rush. His eyes search mine for any hint of discomfort or fear. No pressure. His reassuring words make me feel like a thousand pounds of baggage have been lifted from my shoulders. I can tell he means every word. The silence that follows is thick with unfulfilled lust and lingering sexual tension, but the look he gives me is warm, kind and genuine. I smile, appreciating how effortlessly he seems to understand my needs. He smiles back and kisses the tip of my nose. I'll see you in the morning, sweet Alice. As I slip into my cabin and close the door behind me, my fingertips brush over my lips. The grin refuses to leave my face, and why should it? Waylon. Amazing, charming, hallucination-inducing Waylon. Is interested in me. Me. I feel like I'm floating. Not even with Theo, during those dewy-eyed early days before his sunshine morphed into storm clouds, did I feel this kind of flip-flop in my stomach. Plopping down on my bed, I toy with the idea of breakfast with Waylon tomorrow. Just the thought reignites the needy ache between my legs. The very idea that this man, this gorgeous man, wants me. I'm giddy. And he's so sweet. 
He even played along with my silly bear hallucination, rather than calling it out as the crazy talk it is. That makes him all the more charming. I frown when I notice a text notification come through on my phone. A peek at the screen drags me off of Cloud9 and drops me down to earth with a gut-wrenching thud. It's from Theo. Each word of the text message slices through me like a knife blade. Thought you could run from me, Alice? No one leaves me. I know where you are. See you soon, darling. I feel the blood drain from my face. Suddenly, it's as though I've been transplanted to a barren wasteland with no sunlight. No sustenance. An icy wave of fear washes over me, threatening to pull me under. Memories of Theo, of his jealousy, his rage, rush to the forefront of my mind. Like the time the nice barista at the local coffee shop innocently complimented my earrings. Theo perceived the harmless interaction as flirting and reacted with a brute force that left the poor guy beaten senseless in a back alley and me nursing a black eye and a bruised rib. If Theo shows up here in Mystic Hollow, he'll not only hurt me, he'll hurt any man who is near me. Like Waylon. A pang of fear-laced guilt tugs at my heart. I can't let that happen to Waylon. He doesn't deserve to be hurt. He doesn't deserve to be caught up in my nightmare. I touch my lips again. Waylon. My heart clenches at the thought of that warm friendly smile turning into a grimace of pain. I can't let that happen. I won't. The mere thought is unbearable. There's no doubt in my mind that Waylon can easily replace me with one of the other women. At the very thought of him eating breakfast with someone else, my chest tightens and something that feels dangerously close to jealousy rolls over me, but I quickly push it aside. It's for the best. With a heavy sigh, I put down my phone. My brief moment of joy is gone. Replacing it is a knot of fear that lodges itself firmly in my gut. And just like that, my past smothers the spark of hope that Waylon's kiss had ignited. Chapter 7 With a scowl on my face and arms folded across my chest, I slouch in my chair at Mama's den pouting. Yes, I'm fucking pouting like some big broody tantrum-throwing child. I'm fit to be tied. My gaze remains stubbornly fixed on Alice, seated at a small table with Balin and Kate. My bear is grumbling. Pacing in restless circles. Alice? The woman my gut, my heart and bear all scream is mine, is ignoring me. The only thing keeping me across the room from her, even though my eyeballs follow her every move, is the fact that I can smell her distress. It's a sour note that jars the otherwise delicious scent of her. This morning I was all set to pick her up for breakfast, my mind buzzing with plans to coax out more of her shy smiles, and what was I greeted with? I'll tell you what I was greeted with. An empty cabin, that's what. Now I'm reduced to shooting her pouty scowls while she pointedly avoids my gaze. I'm not at my finest this morning, I'll admit. When it's time to head out for the group hike, I intentionally mosey past Alice's table. Morning, ladies. Kate and Balin both greet me warmly, but Alice won't even meet my eyes. Her gaze remains glued to a spot on the tablecloth. Fuck. I'm back to square one. Every time I think I've breached the wall she's erected, she retreats like a skittish kitten. I don't know what happened. Did I come on too strong yesterday? Or not strong enough? Maybe she doesn't like that I'm a shifter. She seemed okay with it yesterday. Hell, she didn't even seem to believe me, but maybe now that it's had time to sink in, she's scared of me. My bear growls in protest, but what does he know? Out on the ridge, stones crunch beneath my boots as I trudge along the trail peering at Alice's back. The scent of earth, leaves and pine mix with the occasional waft of Alice's sweet scent. I stay close to her, matching my strides with her smaller ones. Every now and then she glances my way, but mostly she's doing a damn good job of ignoring me. When she trips on a root, stumbles and almost falls, I quickly catch her elbow. Stepping next to her, I remain mindful of the space between us. Still, Alice tenses up like a startled deer and I hate that. Hey Alice, I have a question for you. She doesn't respond but she doesn't pull away either so I press on. Why did the botanist fiddle with the radio? I wait until her eyes meet mine before I deliver the punchline. Because she wanted to turn up the beat. A snort escapes her, followed by a soft giggle. It's music to my ears and my heart does a little victory dance. Score one for Team Waylon. Emboldened by her reaction, I take the opportunity to say what I really want to. You know Alice, I keep my voice calm and steady, 
Bear shifters may be large and powerful, and downright ferocious under the right circumstances. I feel her stiffen beside me. Fuck. I run a hand through my hair. I'm fucking this up already. What I'm trying to say is that you can think of me like a big, cuddly teddy bear. I can feel my bear agreeing. He wants to cuddle. My thumb rubs her elbow, a gentle rhythm meant to soothe. I'd never hurt a woman, Alice, let alone someone I care about. My bear, he's not something to be afraid of. He's a part of me, and we have no desire to scare you, only to protect you. I hope my sincerity gets through to her. I need her to understand. I'm not a monster, like you might be imagining. Shifters are honest, protective, and fiercely loyal. And for a split second as she looks at me, I think she might just get it. Her eyes flicker with something that could be understanding, maybe even acceptance. It's as brief as a shooting star, there and gone, but it was there and that's enough for me. At least for now. I pause, clearing my throat awkwardly. How does a botanist fix a flat tire? Her forehead creases. With a pumpkin patch. Her eyes brighten for a moment before she smothers a small giggle behind her hand. That's two for me. Progress. But I still have a long way to go. Stay alert for any wolf shifter sightings and report suspicious activity ASAP, Silas tells us as our meeting concludes. Stepping out of Alpha's office, my mind is spinning. Wolf shifter sightings? Here in Mystic Hollow? My first instinct is to sprint straight back to Alice to make sure she's safe. But I need a plan, something more than brute strength and protective instincts. Lake, hold up a sec. If anyone can help me strategize, it's Lake, so I catch Lake as he's about to head off and clap a hand on his shoulder. As he turns, he slides his glasses up the bridge of his nose. Find your bride-to-be yet. Lake's face falls a tad and he shakes his head. No luck yet. I've been trying, but I don't seem to click with anyone. I honestly didn't think it'd be this hard. I grimace. Sounds rough, buddy. I've got a bit of a situation, myself. I explain about Alice, about her being a bookworm, a botanist, and about how smart she is. It all tumbles out of me like a broken dam. Lake, you and her, you're kinda similar. You're smart. She's smart. I was hoping, well, I was hoping you might be able to help me out. Lake raises a brow. Help you out? Yeah. I nod. Help me break the ice and get her talking. Maybe he can find out what's bothering her. Lake seems skeptical but I push on. She's been giving me the cold shoulder and I just, I don't know what to do. Lake eyes me incredulously. I'll tell you exactly what to do when a woman gives you the cold shoulder. Leave her the fuck alone. Yeah. I let out a long sigh and scratch the back of my neck. The thing is, remember when we teased Silas about Kate being his fated mate? Well Alice, she's... She's my fated mate. The shock on Lake's face is almost comical, but it's soon replaced by a thoughtful expression. Well that changes things, doesn't it? I just need you to get her to open up. Get her to start talking about things that appeal to her. You know about stuff like plants and books. Just get her talking. I'll take it from there. He adjusts his glasses again as he thinks. All right, bro, I'll see what I can do. Relief courses through me, and I pat Lake's shoulder. Thanks, Lake. You're a lifesaver. Chapter 8 BFB Game Night is an interesting event. There's a mix of good old-fashioned board games set up around the large room, and what looks like a serious game of blackjack is taking place in the far corner. Next to it, a group of women are tangled up on a twister mat. Amid all this, I find myself staring at a chessboard. You play. I look up into the eyes of a very handsome man wearing horned-rimmed glasses. Hi. I'm Lake. I shrug. I was in the chess club in school. In that case, I challenge you to a game. He smiles widely, sits down, and motions for me to take the opposite seat. I sort of have no choice but to accept. As soon as I plop down, Waylon shows up. Without being invited, he pulls up a chair to watch. I don't hate that. 
In fact, all I seem to be able to do is think about Waylon and that hot kiss we shared, before I made a complete jerk of myself by pushing him away because I was scared of Theo. I'm still scared of Theo, but now that I've had time to think about it, I doubt my ex has any idea where I am. I was very careful who I told about Mystic Hollow and BFB. I think he was bluffing. Alice is a botanist. Waylon's arms are crossed over his chest as he watches Lake and I study the board and plan our opening moves. Ah, uh, I just read The Secret Life of Plants, Lake says as he moves his pawn to e4. Tompkins and Bird. I light up instantly. You've read it. Three times. I nod. It's quite fascinating. We delve into a conversation about the sensitivity of plants and the scientific experiments detailed in the book. I'm surprised to find Lake is a vault of knowledge. Waylon is scowling. What do you call a plant that loves math? He asks out of nowhere. Lake and I just stare at one another, then I move my pawn to c5. Algae bra. The silence stretches out before Waylon chuckles. Come on guys, that's funny. Lake glances up from the chessboard and asks, Do you have a favorite author, Alice? I tilt my head, considering. I have a soft spot for Mary Shelley. Frankenstein was a masterpiece. Lake's eyes brighten. Ah, the birth of science fiction. I always found it interesting how Shelley wove the themes of nature and the hubris of mankind through the narrative. Exactly. I'm delighted by his insight. That's what makes it timeless. It's a profound commentary on our humanity. What does Frankenstein do when he hears a fire alarm? Waylon interjects. We both glance at him. He bolts. Get it? He bursts out laughing at his own joke. Lake and I exchange looks before turning back to our game. Personally, Lake continues, I'm an Asimov fan. His vision of the future, his articulation of the three laws of robotics, fascinating. Lake and my conversation ebbs and flows for the rest of the game, two bookworms delighting in our shared love of the written word. Lake is nice and fun to talk to, but my mind and body are totally distracted by Waylon's presence. There's an undeniable magnetism that emanates from him, an aura of self-assuredness blended with genuine kindness. His dark tousled hair falls effortlessly, and the dusting of dark stubble on his strong jawline adds a touch of ruggedness to his otherwise flawless features. His muscular arms stretch the fabric of his t-shirt. Every movement he makes is fluid and confident, and when he smiles, his full lips curve in a way that exudes warmth while his eyes glow with mischief and promise. But it's more than just physical. I love how Waylon tries to make everyone laugh and always lightens the mood. There's something about him, something unreserved and endearing. He's unapologetically himself, not caring if he looks foolish or silly. I find that refreshing, especially after my past with Theo who demanded perfection and always had to control everything. We play a good game of chess that ends when Lake puts my king in checkmate. Wanna play again? Lake asks. I'm about to say yes when I feel Waylon's eyes on me. I look over and see he's inserted himself in a game of charades. His eyes hold mine as he swings his arms around, growling and mimicking a bear. Not just any bear. He does a goofy, silly, undeniably cute pantomime that charms the pants off everyone in sight. He's doing a darn good impression of Baloo from the Jungle Book that, I have to admit, is hilarious. When he sees me giggle, he only gets sillier and hams it up even more until I'm laughing so hard my ribs ache. As silly as he is, I have to admit, the man oozes sexiness. Lake rolls his eyes. Looks like he's auditioning for the next Jackass movie. Next thing I know, Waylon is beside me. He takes my hand, sending shivers of desire shooting through me like bottle rockets. There's something so incredibly charming and captivating about him, and I want him with an intensity that startles me. Ready for another game of chess? Lake asks again. Before I can respond, Waylon glowers at him. Actually, I have something I want to show Alice. Lake and Waylon are locked in a staring contest, both glaring at one another. Desperate to break the tension, I stand. Okay. Lead the way. Waylon wraps an arm around me and a smile plays on my lips. It's been a long time since I felt this kind of desire for a man. Somehow, Waylon makes me forget all the horrors I endured with Theo. Theo. I pause momentarily. A hollow threat, probably. I really hope he was just bluffing. I'm surprised when Waylon leads me outside. 
Where are we going? You'll see. He grins down at me, and if I'm not mistaken, he looks a little unsure. Maybe even a little nervous. I follow where he leads, leaving behind the noise and chaos of game night. A part of me is confused, a part curious, but mostly I'm wondering what has Waylon so out of sorts. We walk in comfortable silence, the gentle rustle of leaves underfoot, and ten minutes later, the landscape opens up to a breathtaking sight. A serene mountain pond shimmers under the fading light of the setting sun. It's beautiful, I say, unable to tear my gaze away from the tranquil scene. He still seems anxious and that puzzles me. He checks his watch. I hoped you'd like it. The edge of uncertainty in his voice tugs at my heart. But that's not all. He retrieves a folded blanket from the base of a tree. Where did that come from? Did he stash it here earlier? He spreads the blanket out on the grass, and as realization dawns that Waylon planned this, the corners of my mouth lift into a smile. In just a few minutes now. Ah, there. He points to the pond. My eyes widen. My lips part in awe, and I let out a sharp exhale. Chapter 9 Night blooming water lilies. Alice's hand flies up to cover her mouth as we watch the first of the blooms open. Ivory petals unfurl, reaching out, readying themselves to bask in moonlight. The pond is bathed in an ethereal glow, and shadows dance across its surface. Alice looks thrilled. Relieved, I squeeze her shoulders. She turns to me, eyes shining. Waylon, it's, it's. Her words trail off as she chokes up. Beautiful. Magical. The most romantic thing you've ever seen. I supply with a crooked grin. A laugh bubbles up from her chest. All of that and more. Her fingers curl into my shirt as her gaze slides back to the pond. Thank you for bringing me here. For sharing this with me. Warmth blooms in my chest and I feel like the king of the world right now. The pleasure is all mine, I murmur. I'm not lying. As I watch the joy on her face, the pleasure truly is mine. I draw her down on the blanket and she comes willingly, nestling against my side. We sit in silence for a time, simply enjoying the peaceful beauty surrounding us. The heady scent of night blooms perfumes the air as we watch them slowly open one by one. Lake was pissing me off. I asked him to help me not cockblock me. But out here with Alice by my side, the tension eases from my shoulders. Here in this place of quiet wonder holding this woman in my arms, I find a sense of rightness I've never known before. Almost as if she can read my thoughts, Alice sighs contentedly. I can't believe you brought me here. It's incredible. Her voice sounds as though she's choking up again, and my heart squeezes in my chest. It's not even a tenth of what she deserves, and if I have my way, she'll be showered with words, gifts, and gestures non-stop to let her know how treasured she is. For the rest of our lives. I glance down at Alice. The warmth and affection shining in her eyes steal my breath. I want to spoil this woman rotten. You are so beautiful, Alice. You have no idea how incredibly beautiful you are. A blush stains her cheeks and she ducks her head. I should probably stop but I can't help myself. It truly baffles me that she doesn't know how special she is. You sell yourself short. You're kind and caring, strong yet gentle. When you smile at me. Hell, every time you laugh at me, my heart nearly stops. Lifting her head, she graces me with a radiant smile. This woman that fate has blessed me with is so much more than I ever dared to dream of finding, and I know with certainty that she is my future. My always. The missing piece that makes me whole. My smile is reflected in her eyes as I draw her close and pepper gentle kisses on her sweet lips. Our kisses grow increasingly heated and hungry as passion ignites between us, fueled by the depth of emotion, of connection. Is this the mate bond growing? My hands roam her body, learning her curves and she arches into my touch with a throaty moan that sets me on fire. Her fingers curl into my hair, nails scraping lightly over my scalp. The sensation goes straight to my groin, arousal pooling hot and heavy as my cock strains against the confines of my jeans. I break the kiss, panting harshly as I stare down into Alice's flushed face. Her lips are kiss-swollen. Her eyes are glazed with a desire that mirrors my own. I want you. My raspy voice is rough with need. Here. Now. I can't wait anymore. A smile curves her mouth slow and sinful. Then don't. Her words unleash the beast in me, and the last vestiges of my control shred. A low growl rumbles from my chest as I surge forward and pin her beneath me on the blanket. 
My hands come up to frame her face, and I devour her mouth in another searing kiss that leaves us both panting. Our passion burns hot and wild. My hands roam, exploring every dip and curve as if I were mapping her body. Her moans fill the air, driving me crazy with want. The heat between us is almost tangible, electric shocks of pleasure shoot through me with each breath. I can feel my bear moving just beneath the surface, rippling under my skin. Alice's hands trail down my chest, gripping the fabric of my shirt before tugging it up and over my head. Her fingertips dance across my skin, leaving flames everywhere they touch. Desire and need threaten to overwhelm me. Alice's eyes smolder with the same need as I slowly remove the rest of our clothing until nothing remains between us but skin and heat and hunger. I trace lazy circles around one of her nipples with my tongue before sucking it into my mouth, eliciting a soft moan from her. Her hips buck against mine, silently urging me on as I move to the other nipple. Her hands skim over my back before dipping lower, coming to rest just above my ass. She isn't shy about tugging me closer, so close that our groins press together in an intimate embrace that sends a blaze of heat through both of us. I roll slightly to the side and my fingers wander lower until they brush against the small patch of soft curls at the apex of her thighs. Alice gasps and arches into my touch, begging for more. I nudge her legs apart with my knee and comply eagerly, slipping one finger deep inside her tight heat before adding another and then a thud. She trembles and moans, hips rocking up to meet each thrust as pleasure builds in her. She's magnificent. When I have her right on the edge, I position myself between her thighs, bracing my weight on one forearm while I slide my other hand down to guide my aching cock to her entrance. She's so wet like hot silk and molten fire. Her body welcomes me in with a single thrust that has us both crying out in unison. For a moment I can only remain still, eyes closed and jaw clenched as I struggle not to come undone right then and there. She feels too damn good like heaven on earth and the primal urge to mate threatens to override all thought and reason. Somehow I manage to cling to a shred of control, and I begin moving in a slow steady rhythm that quickly has Alice writhing beneath me. The sensation is indescribable. Nothing has ever felt so perfect in all my life. We move together in tandem, rising higher and higher. Alice's nails score red lines down my back as she meets each thrust, pleading for more in a litany of moans and gasps. I bury my face in the curve of her neck, breathing in her scent and growling against her skin. You are mine, I grit out, hips thrusting forward to emphasize each word. My mate. My always. My everything. She cries out in answer, her body tensing as she comes apart around me. Her climax triggers my own, a roar tearing from my throat as I drive into her once more. White-hot pleasure blurs my senses and I spill deep inside her welcoming heat. For a long moment we simply lie together, limbs entwined and hearts pounding. Everything about being with her gives off a sense of rightness. There is no doubt she's my fated mate. Eventually, the sounds of nature gradually filter back in. The gentle lap of water. Frogs croaking. Crickets chirping. The rustle of leaves in the faint breeze. Alice stirs beside me, tilting her head back to meet my gaze. Her eyes are luminous in the pale moonlight, and a soft, wondering smile stretches over her face. You said something about faded mates. Did I say that out loud? I didn't mean to. I don't regret it, though. It's true. It's an old shifter legend. My fingers trace idle patterns over the smooth skin of her hip. I thought it was an old wives' tale but I know better now. She leans up slightly on her elbow. An old wife's tale? About what? About two souls who are destined to be together, made for each other, created for one another. Some believe fate itself ordains these matches. My hand stills, palm resting over the steady beat of her heart. That's what we are, Alice. You and me. Fated mates. Her breath catches, eyes widening. For a moment I'm afraid I said too much too fast. Then a beaming smile breaks over her face. Fated mates, she whispers and presses her mouth to mine. Fate may have bound us together, but this connection between Alice and me, this bond, is one that I will cherish every day for the rest of my life. Chapter 10 As I crouch to pick another wild blueberry from the bush, I can't wipe the smile from my face. What a glorious morning! I feel spectacular. I'm wonderful. Waylon is wonderful. Life is wonderful. Dropping the blueberry in my pail, I can't help but marvel at the beauty of nature. Thought you could just run away from me, did you? The voice slithers through the air like a venomous snake. 
Theo. I whirl around. My pulse races. My palms grow sweaty and I freeze in place. No. No. My hands tremble as I grip the pail of blueberries. I steal a glance around, desperate for anything that might save me from this nightmare come to life. Please, Theo, I plead, trying to keep my voice steady. Just leave me alone. You don't need to hurt me. Please, Theo. He says mimicking me in a high-pitched mocking voice. You never learn, do you? Because you're fucking stupid. I scramble to buy time as I rack my brain for an escape plan. What, what are you doing here, Theo? And how did you even find me? Your nosy neighbor, Maureen. He smirks, stepping closer. The one you asked to water your plants. A little flattery, and the old bat couldn't resist spilling the tea, all about your little vacation to Mystic Hollow. I'm shaking so hard my teeth are rattling. My eyes start to water, blurring my vision, but I notice a flash of color a few yards behind Theo. No. Oh God, no. It's Waylon. Every instinct in me wants to protect him. To warn Waylon, to tell him to leave. To run. But that would just draw Theo's attention to him. My only hope is to provoke Theo and make him come after me. If Theo's focused on me, he won't notice Waylon. Fuck you, Theo. A sinister sneer spreads over Theo's face. I'm gonna make you pay, bitch. He takes a threatening step toward me. I'm gonna beat the shit out of you, you stupid cunt. I'm trembling, but I can't stomach the thought of Waylon getting hurt. Mentally, I will Waylon to turn around and leave. To run. Please don't let Theo see you, I plead with my eyes, hoping he'll understand. Stay hidden. But he doesn't. Instead he... Well, he transforms into a massive grizzly bear. Like one second he's a man, and the next he's a bear, and this time, I know it's not a hallucination. I know exactly what I'm seeing. Whoa! I whisper, my jaw dropping in awe. Theo doesn't notice until a growl erupts from the bear, so loud, so fierce, and so menacing that the ground shakes. Theo jumps at the sound and whips around. What the fuck? His eyes go wide and he backs up until he hits a tree. I stand a little taller as I look Theo dead in the eye. That's my bear. Picking up on my cue, the bear. Um. Waylon. Snarls and growls at Theo, practically frothing at the mouth as he lumbers over to stand beside me. He's huge. Gigantic. His back is level with my shoulder. You, you have a, a bear. I see genuine terror in his eyes for the first time since I've known Theo. I should probably feel sorry for him. But I don't. A surge of emotion rushes up in me, and all I can see are visions of all the times he called me stupid, and an annoying idiot and a loser. I'm not stupid, I say in a quivering voice. And then I say it again more forcefully. I'm not stupid. You asshole. I'm not stupid, I'm not annoying, and I'm not a loser. Theo just nods as a wet spot grows on the front of his pants. Waylon growls and snaps his fangs at a horrified Theo, but remains at my side feeding me strength and courage. Show him what will happen if he doesn't hightail it out of town and forget Mystic Hollow exists, I command. Waylon grunts in agreement and takes a swipe at Theo with his massive six-inch claws. Theo yelps in pain and sobs like a baby as crimson blood blooms from the jagged gashes torn into his arm. Good. I nod my approval. Show him what will happen if he dares to set foot in this town ever again. This time there's a gleam in my bear's eyes as he swipes his lethal paw at Theo once more. Theo cries out clutching his chest where fresh wounds. Parallel claw marks. Seep red. I can't help but feel a sense of satisfaction seeing my abuser blubber and cower in fear. Now, show him what will happen if he ever hurts another woman ever again. With a ferocious growl, Waylon lunges forward, clamping his powerful jaws onto Theo's torso and sinking his sharp teeth into Theo's pasty flesh. Theo screams in agony, tears and snot streaming down his face. Okay, that's enough. I place a hand on Waylon's furry side and he releases Theo, who crumples to the ground, gasping for breath. Get out of here, Theo, I warn my voice cold and unyielding. If I ever see you again, you'll wish my bear had finished the job. Theo nods weakly, blood pouring from him as he drags his mauled and battered body away as fast as his injuries will allow. The moment he's out of sight, the intensity of the situation hits me hard, and I double over trying to catch my breath. I feel vindicated. I feel victorious. As I clutch my stomach staring at the ground, I see bare feet rather than bare feet cautiously under my view. You really can. 
You really do. You really are a bear. I choke out. Waylon clears his throat and his voice sounds strained. About what just happened, Alice, I swear I would never hurt you. Never. I'll only ever protect you. I straighten, surprised to see the worry lines etched on his face. Does he think that I'm turned off by the violence he just exhibited? Does he think I'm afraid of him? I know, I reply reassuringly. I know you'd never hurt me. I smile, my heart swelling with love and gratitude. Because we're fated mates. Chapter 11 We could have skipped this, you know. Stayed in bed all day. I whisper in Alice's ear as my hand covers hers. For some reason the sight of Alice's hands running up and down the wet clay, smoothing it as the pottery wheel turns makes my dick hard. I put up a good argument this morning for staying at home, but not good enough. Alice insisted we attend the BFB Arts and Crafternoon, to support Balin who is running the event since Kate the BFB coordinator left town. According to Zandros, Silas went running after Kate, and now they're both MIA. Alice's loyalty to friends, even new ones like Balin, is one of the countless reasons I love her. Alice grins. What happened to being sociable? Of the two of us, you're the outgoing one. I'll be sociable. I nibble her neck as she squeals and squirms. I'll be sociable all over you in our bed. She laughs, the sound brightening the room and making me even more desperate to get her alone for more one-on-one -on -one time. I can't get enough of her. When Lake walks by he nods at Alice and she flashes him one of her beautiful smiles. A few days ago, that would have riled me up, bristling my fur and sending a pang of jealousy through me. But today… Today I'm cool with them being friends. That fucker can eat his heart out. It's my claiming mark she's wearing, a brand new and very prominent claiming mark I might add, and Lake's eyes are glued to it. I can't help but feel a sense of satisfaction wash over me. Alice leans over to whisper in my ear, her breath warm against my skin. Poor Lake. He still hasn't found his fated mate. It looks like he might be the only one remaining single at the end of these festivities. I hope the next BFB round will bring someone special for him. Yeah, me too. I mean that. Now that I'm experiencing the joy Alice brings to my life, I think everyone deserves to find their other half. Besides, Lake's a good guy, and despite his crush on Alice, he's still a friend. He deserves his own happily ever after. Alice and I stay to help clean up the crafternoon. It seems Zandros and Balin are an item, and Hernan may have found himself a mate as well. So, my little botanist, I say as we leave the community center, you want to go catalog some plants in the woods while I shift? I waggle my brows as I ask because the first thing I'm planning to do is corner her up against a tree and fuck her brains out. She knows it too because her eyes sparkle with anticipation. Sounds perfect. She nods and takes off running. She knows I love to chase her, and I'm thrilled my mate likes the woods as much as I do. I let her run a bit before I catch her. It's no fun otherwise, but when I do, my lips meet hers in a fiery kiss that ignites every nerve ending in my body. Her legs wrap around me, and I back her against the nearest oak tree. I can't help but be in awe of this woman who's so full of life, love and passion, despite everything she's been through. Waylon, she gasped, clutching at me as her breath comes in ragged pants. I can feel her heart racing against mine, and it only fuels my desire for her. But when a blood-curdling scream rings out through the trees, we both freeze. It takes a second to process, but then Alice and I both take off running toward it. What we find are several women, the FB bride candidates standing around looking shell-shocked. One of them, I think her name is Tiffany, is crying. Someone took her. A man. She releases a loud, wailing sound. Oh my god, she was kidnapped. Alice's eyes widen and she inhales sharply. Who? Who was kidnapped? The poor woman's shaking like a leaf. Marla. Marla? Alice glances at me and then back at Tiffany. Hernan's Marla? I've already got my cell phone out and I'm dialing Zandros's number. None of the women know what I know, but it's not just any man who took Marla. The whole area stinks. Like Wolf Shifter. Epilogue. A year later. Talk about a summer scorcher. I fan myself as the midday sun beats down on the metal bleachers at Mystic Hollow Park's Little League baseball field. I dab at my forehead with a tissue and a bead of sweat rolls down between my breasts. 
Next to me, Alpha Silas downs another hot dog in two bites, I think it's his third, and a container of nachos rests on his knee. Waylon is so good with the boys, Kate remarks, her gaze following the action on the diamond. Turning my attention back to the game, I can't help the surge of pride I feel as I watch my husband tell his dad jokes in between coaching his team. His enthusiasm is infectious. Waylon's always had a way with kids. Silas nods and grins at me. He's coached and mentored for years. I'd like to think he's practicing. My hand unconsciously cradles my large midsection. We're hoping to fill our house with our own little league team. Silas lets out a hearty laugh. Well, you're already on the way to a good start with twins. Laughing, I rub my belly which, at almost eight months pregnant, is swollen to an impressive proportion. Hey, I turn to Kate, how's Balin? I've been meaning to stop over this week. Great. She and Xandros wanted to come but didn't want to drag Princess out in this heat. I'm about to respond when one of the kids hits a home run and the crowd erupts into cheers. Way to go, Grizzlies. Silas jumps up, yelling and whistling. The moment the game is over, Waylon heads toward us, his grin beaming. I feel a flutter in my heart as his eyes meet mine. There's the winning coach. I call as he reaches us. Had a little help from my cheering squad. He pulls me into a gentle hug before pressing a kiss to my neck, right over his claiming mark. You mean your pregnant cheerleader? I tease. I love this man with every fiber of my being, and he loves me too. He shows me time and again. He takes my hand in his as we walk to the parking lot. You feeling okay? The heat's not too much for you, is it? I'm good, but I would like to get into some air conditioning. We're all headed to Mama's Den where Wayland and I always treat his team to pizza after a game. He leans over and whispers in my ear. Knock knock. I giggle. Who's there? Owl. I know where this is going. Owl who? I'll always love you. He peppers kisses on my face as he scoops me and my big belly up and sits me on the passenger seat of his truck. He's about to close the door and go around to the driver's side when I stop him. Not so fast. I've got a joke for you too. He cocks a brow. Knock knock. Who's there? Lycan. He grins from ear to ear. Lycan who? I slip my arms around his neck. I'm liking you too, mate. We hope you have enjoyed this computer-generated audio production of Protected Mate by Candace Ayers and Kim Dillon. To ensure these authors are able to bring you more free content, please support them by subscribing to this channel. The next book in this series is Wrong Mate.